All right, well, good morning, everyone. It's a great day to be in the house all morning, Amen. Amen. Why don't you stand with me, and we'll start our worship service by, with uh, our responsive reading. Our responsive reading this week is from a letter to the Hebrews, chapter 5. We're going to do verses 5 through 10. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As he says also in another place, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he had suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day. Lord Jesus, be with us as we're gathered here in your house, brothers and sisters in the faith. And fill us, Lord, with your love. Fill us, Lord, with your grace. We ask, Lord, that you forgive us of our sins and that you wipe us clean and let us stand uh, worthy in your presence because of your love, because of your sacrifice. Lord, we lift up to you all of those that are on our prayer requests, Lord God. Pray that you would bless and be with them. We pray, Lord, that you would bless and be with the gifts that we receive today, that you would continue to guide our church to use these to share the gospel with a, a, a sad and lonely world, Lord. Lord, we pray for those that give, that they give with cheerful and generous hearts, knowing that all things come from you and all things return to you. We love you, Jesus, and we ask for all this in your name. Amen. All right, so this week, our fourth week of Lent, we are going to be in the Gospel of John again. We're going to be in John chapter 12. John chapter 12, and actually we're also going to read John chapter 11 as a part of the, of the message. But for now, we're going to be in John chapter 12. We're going to read verses 1 through 11. And uh, the, the title of this message, and it's really pretty straightforward when you look at uh, what we're going to be talking about is, is Jesus is worth your best. And, and Jesus truly is. He is worth the best of everything that you have. Not the second, not the third. He's worth the best of everything we have. Also note that the story that we're going to read today takes place in a little town called Bethany, which is only a couple of miles outside of Jerusalem. And all throughout the Gospels, you see Jesus often going to Bethany. And Bethany was like, Bethany was like a little place where Jesus could always find rest. In all of the craziness, everywhere that he went, people were always after him. People were always trying to kill him, right? People were always trying to plot against him. But in Bethany, there's a reason why Jesus often went there to rest. And it's because he was loved there. And there were people there that cared for him deeply. So as you read through the scriptures, every time you note that Jesus was in Bethany, notice how there's always rest for Jesus in Bethany, right? And the reality is we all need a place like Bethany in our lives, whether that's our home, whether that's our church. But we all need a place where we can get away from everything and rest, right? So, John chapter 12, starting at verse 1. And we're going to read verses 1 through 11. Six days before the Passover, Jesus came to Bethany, the home of Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. And there he gave a dinner for him. Martha served, and Lazarus was one of those at the table with him. Mary took a pound of costly perfume made of pure nard, anointed Jesus' feet, and wiped them with her hair. The house was filled with the fragrance of the perfume. But Judas Iscariot, one of the disciples, the one who was about to betray him, said, Why was this perfume not sold for 300 denarii and the money given to the poor? He said this not because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. He kept the common purse and used to steal what was put into it. Jesus said, leave her alone. She bought it so that she might keep it for the day of my burial. You always have the poor with you, but you do not always have me. And when the great crowd of the Jews learned that he was there, they came not only because of Jesus, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. 
since uh, whom he had raised from the dead as well, since it was on account of him that many of the Jews were deserting and were believing in Jesus. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. We pray, Lord, that you would bless and be with us and fill this place with the Holy Spirit. Lord, fill our hearts with the Holy Spirit that it may, that it may be tender to the leading of your word. And fill our ears and our minds with the Holy Spirit that we may learn your word, that we may love your word, and that we may live your word. And we ask for this in your precious name, Jesus. Amen. So like I said, we're on the fourth Sunday of Lent. Next week starts Passion Week with Palm Sunday next Sunday. And as we continue in our Lenten series on the Gospels of Mark and John, we see Jesus moving towards Calvary, right? He's moving towards the cross. He's moving towards the culmination of his earthly ministry. And we come to this story in the scriptures on that journey. And it leads us to discuss and challenges us to truly understand what it means to worship Jesus. What it means to worship Jesus. Do you ever ask yourself, what does it mean to worship Jesus? What does it mean to worship Jesus? It's clearly evident in the story that we just read that Mary was worshiping Jesus. But what does that mean? Let's start with some definition and some background. John Piper, famous Bible scholar and theologian, says this about worship. We worship God authentically when we know him truly and treasure him duly. Then the word worship refers to that valuing, that inner valuing, becoming visible in the world in two basic ways in the New Testament. One is acts of the mouth acts of praise and repentance and worship services or small group gatherings. The other is acts of love with the body and the hands and the feet. Acts of love that show the supreme value of God by what we are willing to sacrifice for the good of our others. It's a great definition, right? Brothers and sisters, there is so much debate about worship in our day. I have spoken to pastors all over in the past that were literally ready to resign from churches because of the conflict they encounter regarding corporate worship. Literally congregations that are torn apart. And honestly, it seems like the majority of the grumbling that you encounter in the worship wars has to deal with style of music or instrumentation. And we're pretty fortunate here at 815. We avoid all that because we don't have any music. But I've been in lots of churches where that's a big issue. And quite honestly, I'm happy that I really, for the most part, haven't heard it here. Yeah, there's some that like it one way and some that like it another way. I mean, personally, if it were me, that organ never would have been sold. We'd have the organ still going in here and a big old choir, but... Worship isn't about my preference or your preference. Worship is about God. Worship is about Jesus. Because if you're worshiping a preference, guess who you're worshiping? Yourself. Yourself. My dear friend, Dr. Shane Johnson, who, who's one of the, the, a huge mentor in my life, a huge professor in my life, he was uh, one of the ones that, that kind of helped guide me back into school here. I remember a story that he told in one of our classes at Malone where he was so disappointed at what the congregation was fighting about that he actually considered taking his life. And he said they argued about stuff like should we gravel or asphalt the parking lot? Should we have chairs or views? Should we have, you know, these kinds of lights or those kinds of lights? that we're fighting like that over stuff that's trivial, trivial. But brothers and sisters, we need to understand one thing, and that is that the crucial factor in worship in the church is not the form of worship, but it's the state of the heart of the worshipers. It's the state of the heart of the worshipers. If our corporate worship isn't the expression of our individual worshiping lives, then it's unacceptable. It's that simple. If you think that you can live any way you want and then go to church on Sunday morning and turn on worship with the saints, you're wrong. You're wrong. And I remember as a kid going to Catholic school, man, that I was locked into that. I'd do whatever I wanted 
Monday through Friday. I did confession Saturday night at 5.30 and I was good to go. That is not right. So given all that, and in light of the scripture that we read this morning, you need to challenge yourself. What is your view of worship? What is your view of worship? Is worship just what happens in church on Sunday mornings? Do you identify with with an emotional experience or spiritual thoughts or maybe performing certain rituals? Because the real fact is this, true worship is not defined by a place. It is not identified by a feeling or by a ritual. God set the standard for worship in his word and God's standard besides being perfect is much higher than anything that we can imagine. So as we look at our text this morning, and at the act of worship performed by Mary, Lazarus' sister, we really should back up one chapter to chapter 11 and read about one of the most amazing miracles that occurred in Jesus' ministry in all the scriptures, the raising of Lazarus. So let's recap that. And I think the best way to recap it is to just let's read it real quick. Turn with me to chapter 11. We're going to start at verse 1 and we're going to read the story. John chapter 11, the, the chapter right before what we just read. Now a man named Lazarus was sick. He was from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha. This Mary, whose brother Lazarus now lay sick, was the same who had poured perfume on the Lord and wiped his feet with her hair. So the sisters went, the sisters sent word to Jesus, Lord, the one you love is sick. And when he heard this, Jesus said, this sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. Now Jesus loved Martha and her sister and Lazarus. So when he heard that Lazarus was sick, he stayed where he was for two more days. And then he said to his disciples, let us go back to Judea. But Rabbi, they said, a short while ago the Jews there tried to stone you, and now you're going back? And Jesus said, are, you, are there not twelve hours of daylight? Anyone who walks in the daytime will not stumble, for they see the world's light. It is when a person walks at night that they stumble, for they have no light. After he had said this, he went on to tell them, Our friend Lazarus has fallen asleep, but I'm going there to wake him up. And his disciples replied, Lord, if he sleeps, he will get better. Jesus had been speaking of his death, but the disciples thought he meant natural sleep. So then he told them plainly, Lazarus is dead. And for your sake, I'm glad that I was not there so that you may believe. But let us go to him. And then Thomas, also known as Didymus, said to the rest of the disciples, Let us go, that we may die with him. And on it, by the way, that little exchange between Jesus and the apostles, that's a great exchange, right? Because you can really see the difference between Jesus, the teacher, and the apostles who really are learning and just aren't picking up on things yet, right? Our brother Lazarus is asleep. Well, if he's asleep, that means he's getting better. And she's like, he's dead. And we're going there to wake him up. And they're worried to go back. Why are they worried to go back? Because the Jews were there that want to kill Jesus. They're like, well, let's go. We're all going to get killed, right? Verse 17, on his arrival, Jesus found Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Now, Bethany was less than two miles from Jerusalem, and many Jews had come to Martha and Mary to comfort them in their loss. And when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out to meet him, but Mary stayed at home. Lord, Martha said to Jesus, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But now I know that even God will give you whatever you ask. And Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. And Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? Yes, Lord, she replied, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God, who is to come into the world. After she had said this, she sat back and called her sister Mary aside. The teacher is here, she said, and he's asking for you. And when Mary heard this, she got up quickly and went to him. And now Jesus had not yet entered the village, but was still at the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who had been with Mary in the house, comforting her, noticed how quickly she got up and went out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the, to the tomb to mourn there. When Mary reached the place where Jesus was and saw him, she fell and said, Lord, 
If you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come along with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in spirit and troubled. Where have you laid him, he asked. Come and see, Lord, they replied. And Jesus wept. And the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not the one who opened the eyes of the blind have kept this man from dying? Jesus, once more deeply moved, came to the tomb. It was a cave with a stone laid across the entrance. Take away the stone, he said. But Lord, said Martha, by this time there's a bad odor, for he has been there for four days. And then Jesus said, did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? So they took away the stone. And then Jesus looked up and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. I know that you will always hear me. But I said this for the benefit of the people standing here, that they may believe that you sent me. And when he had said this, Jesus called in a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the dead man came out, his hands and feet wrapped in strips of linen and cloth around his face. And Jesus said to them, take the great clothes off of him and let him go. Brothers and sisters, that story always just blows my mind. Can you fully grasp the joy that must have filled the hearts of Mary and Martha? I guarantee you that Mary, Martha, Lazarus, anyone who witnessed this event never ever forgot what they just saw happen. Lazarus was dead for four days. And now he's alive. And now he's alive. So that sets the stage for chapter 12 where, where we read that beautiful picture of worship offered by Mary. She comes before her Savior. She bows down before him and anoints his feet with very costly perfume. And do you know why feet were washed and anointed during this time? Uh, we're going to see it again on Holy Thursday when we talk about the foot washing. Feet were washed and anointed because back then everyone took their shoes off, their sandals off, and feet stunk. So to stop the overwhelming odor of feet in the room when they were eating, they would be anointed with perfume to cover up and to mask the feet, right? Because I think sometimes we think about like washing feet, but like in America, like for us, even the dirtiest of feet would be the cleanest feet that anybody in Jesus' time had ever seen. Right? So she was doing a job that wasn't really pleasant. She, and then she went on to wipe the feet with her hair. Notice, brothers and sisters, that the actions of Mary paint a picture of the kind of worship that we should be offering our Savior today. That is biblical worship, what Mary did. Worshiping at the feet of Jesus, the Messiah. So let's take a little walk through these verses and consider the thought of worshiping at the feet of Jesus. The first thing we should talk about is the place of our worship. The place of our worship. Now if you read this story in, in the Gospel of Mark in chapter 14, we find that this event took place in what's, called, it's what, in what's referred to as the house of Simon the leper. Gathered in this house were Simon, Lazarus, Martha, Mary, Judas Iscariot, and all the rest of the disciples. And though there were several followers present, each one had different things on their mind. From what we know, Martha, once again, was concerned with making sure that the Lord's needs were being met, right? It seems that Lazarus and Simon were enjoying fellowship with the Lord. The disciples were listening to the Lord. However, however, Mary was the one who was offering worship to the Lord. She was offering worship to the Lord. This scene actually illustrates a very important fact concerning worship. And that fact is that you can be gathered among other believers you can even be in the presence of Jesus and still miss out on worship. And still miss out on worship. Worshiping the Savior is both a corporate and a personal action. But in the moment of worship, but in this moment of worship, we can see something important about the proper place of worship. 
Because if you know, Mary was not in a temple. She was not in a synagogue. She was not in a church or a cathedral. Mary was in her house. And the key here is not the place where she physically was. The key here is the place where she spiritually was. Because the fact is that Mary was in the presence of Jesus, and that is what mattered. And that is what mattered. Brothers and sisters, that's our answer. The proper place of worship is in the presence of Jesus. That means that our worship is not limited to a certain time or a certain location. We don't have to bow down facing the east multiple times a day. We don't have to take a yearly trip to a specific destination. We don't have to enter into a church building in order to worship our Savior. We don't have to wait until Sunday at 8.15 or 11 o'clock to worship Jesus. We can worship Jesus where he is. And do you know where Jesus is? He's everywhere. He's inside of you. He's everywhere. Let's be honest. Far too many believers fail to worship the Lord Monday through Saturday. For that matter, there's a bunch that gather together that fail to worship the Lord on Sunday too. But true worship, brothers and sisters, true worship should occur in the life of every believer each and every day of your life, wherever you are. So we are to worship in the presence of Jesus. That brings us to our next point, the purpose of our worship, the purpose of our worship. There are countless reasons to worship Jesus. And I think we can sum up the, 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 the reasons to worship Jesus in two phrases. We worship Jesus because of who he is, and we worship Jesus because of what he has done. So let's look at both of those for a moment. First, worshiping Jesus for who he is. Who is Jesus? We know that Jesus is the Messiah. He is the promised one of God. We know that he is the Savior. He is our deliverer. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He is the first begotten of the world. He is the eternal God. He is the creator of the universe. Jesus exhibits the glory of the Father. He is the Word of God. He is the sustainer of all things. Brothers and sisters, Jesus is our Lord and Savior, and he is worthy of worship simply because of those facts, simply because of who he is. And not only is he worthy of worship because of who he is, he is worthy of worship because of what he has done. So what has Jesus done? What has Jesus done? Well, because of our Savior's actions, we know this, that through faith, all of our sins have been forgiven. Through faith, all of our sins have been forgiven. We have been rescued from hell. We have been adopted and are now children of God. We now have a personal relationship with God. We are now joint heirs of the kingdom with Jesus Christ. We have the promise of eternal life. We have a home in heaven forever. Now this doesn't mean that the only reason that Mary was worshiping Jesus was the fact that he had raised her brother from the dead. But you've got to believe that this may have been one of the motivations for her worship. In the previous chapter that we read, we witnessed the grief and the sorrow that Mary possessed. We saw as she cried in agony over the loss of her dear brother. And then Jesus showed up and performed a miracle. And now Lazarus is sitting at the table with them enjoying dinner. It's incredible. It's incredible. Brothers and sisters, please note that real worship always reveals a heart of gratitude. Real worship always reveals a heart of, of gratitude. And you need to ask yourself, are you thankful for who Jesus is and for what Jesus has done? Because if you are, then bow before him and offer him the worship that he so rightly deserves. There's another important factor that we see in Mary's worship. And we see that she gave all she had, and not only all she had, 
She gave the best of what she had. And she held nothing back. So the third point to consider is the price of our worship. Or the cost of our worship. In verse 3, it says that Mary took a pound of ointment, spikenard, very costly, and anointed Jesus' feet with it. So Mary had this box of perfume. She broke this box and used the perfume to anoint the feet of Jesus. This was an incredibly valuable box of perfume. It was made of nard or spike nard, depending on what version you're reading. It's the same thing, which was a very rare plant found only in India. And it was difficult to acquire. It was very expensive. In verse 5, Judah says that the value of the ointment was 300 denarii. Now, a denarii, one denarii, was the daily wage of a worker. So the approximate value of this box of perfume was nearly a month's wages, or at the very least 10 months, 10 months wages, right? 300 days, approximately three months wages. The box of perfume was a part of the Jewish burial ritual. After a person had died, their body would be washed, the box of ointment would be broken, and the spices and perfumes would be used to anoint the body. And the broken fragments of the box would then be included with the remains of the deceased. Now there's no question that Mary had this in mind as she worshiped Jesus. It is quite possible that Mary had saved for many years to purchase this one box of ointment for her own funeral. And it's very possible that this was the single most valuable possession that Mary owned. And what did she do with it? She gave it all to Jesus. She gave it all to Jesus. So we see that Mary's worship cost her something. It cost her a lot. It cost her the most valuable thing that she possessed. We find that in this version in Mark chapter 14, she broke the box and poured out its context, its contents. So think about that too. She didn't just pour out a little and keep the rest for herself. She gave every bit to Jesus. Mary's sacrifice was costly. It was the ultimate expression of love and worship that she had for Jesus. She gave all. And it comes back to that question for us, brothers and sisters. What about you? What are you willing to give to Jesus? When you look at it biblically, you come to understand that worship is so much more than attending a church service. It's so much more than praying or studying together. It is so much more than sitting back and listening to a sermon. It is so much more than bowing your heads and raising your hands. It is so much more than mumbling through prayers and songs on Sunday morning. Brothers and sisters, worship is a life of value opened up and poured out to Jesus Christ. It is a life of value opened up and poured out to Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Have you come to a place where you have broken your jar of ointment and poured out everything to Jesus and given everything to Jesus? Because when you do, that's when you truly understand true worship. You see, not only did Mary understand the price of worship, she also grasped the proper posture of worship. Because it says that Mary anointed the feet of Jesus, so why his feet with her hair. So what we see in Mary's posture was the position of worship. She was humble, bowed down at the feet of Jesus. In this act of worship, she washed, she washed his feet. And like I said earlier, this was normally a task that was reserved for a slave or, or the lowest person of status and attendance. But at this point, Mary was not consumed with pride. She wasn't worried about what anyone else thought of her. She was a humble servant of Jesus who was focused only on offering him what he was worthy of. Many believers today miss out on true worship because they're worried about how they're going to be viewed by others. Even in church, people hold back praise because they're focused on, on people rather than being focused on Jesus. Half-hearted worship 
brothers and sisters, is not worship. It's got to be with your whole heart, not hold anything back. What, when you're reading prayers out loud, out loud, when you're singing, don't care about what people think. Now, don't care what you sound like. This is between you and your Savior. It's not between you and everybody else. I'm the worst singer ever. If it's not rapping something that sounds like Tone Loke, I sound horrible. But when I sing, I sing. I don't, I don't care. Right? God's not judging my voice. He's judging my heart. Mary humbly bowed down before Jesus and served him and worshipped him. And it also brings that service is a part of worship. It says that Mary anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his hair in the house was filled with the smell of the perfume. Mary gave all that she had. Though she did not do this for those who were present, her worship didn't go unnoticed. And her worship benefited everyone in the house. We read that it says the house was filled with the scent of the perfume. Mary in this moment did what she and she alone was personally led to do. But I can't help but think when the others witnessed this act of worship that their hearts must have been filled with worship also, right? As the shock of the year's wages being poured over the Savior's feet wears off, as their hostess washes his feet with her hands and her hair, as the home was filled with the beautiful scent of the spikenard, I'm sure that they began to ponder the greatness of the Savior too. I'm sure that Lazarus began to think of the amazing miracle that Jesus performed in his life. And maybe, maybe Simon the leper thought back to the day when Jesus cured his leprosy. And maybe Martha thought back to the sorrow she faced and the joy she experienced as Lazarus came out of the tomb. It is very possible, brothers and sisters, that a good old worship service was on the verge of erupting in that house. And then Judas spoke up. And then Judas spoke up. You see, Mary's worship was passionate and sincere worship. And it should be our desire to offer the Lord passionate and sincere worship every single day of our lives. And let's, let's bring in a couple of definitions that I think we need to understand. Because there's a big difference between praise and worship. There's a big difference between praise and worship. The word praise in the Bible is, is uh, used as follows, okay? Um, it's either the word yada, which means to confess or to give thanks. Ahino, which means to celebrate, or doxa, which means to give glory and honor. So if you look at it from that perspective, praise really consists of, of words and, and songs. It's lifting up the name of Jesus. It's celebrating him for who he is and what he's done. It's, it's an act of gratitude and thanksgiving. So while praise is, an, is, is essential to worship, it is not worship. It is not worship. What is worship? Well, the word worship in Hebrew is shakah. And shakah actually means to depress. It actually means to lie flat, to bow down, to, to, to give reverence to. The Greek word that's used for worship is latreu. And latreu is actually defined as giving religious honor, giving religious honor. So clearly there's a difference while praise is a part of worship, worship goes beyond praise. And worship is something that should be incorporated into our everyday lives. Into our everyday lives. When we serve others, it's a form of worship. When we show compassion, it's a form of worship. When we extend love to another, it's a form of worship. When we serve the Lord, it's a form of worship. Our entire lives, brothers and sisters, should be a form of worship. I believe that it can be said of Mary that her entire life was an act of worship. Every single time you see Mary mentioned in the scriptures, she is at the feet of Jesus. Mary grasped the proper posture of worship, and she worshipped Jesus passionately. So how do we bring all this together for us, brothers and sisters? 
The question is this. Are you willing to come to a place where you will bow at the feet of Jesus, where you will serve in whatever capacity is necessary and forget what anyone else thinks? Because when you get to that point, then you're ready for true worship. So as we close, ask yourself this. Is your life a life that's lived at the feet of Jesus? Is your life a life of worship? Now it's very possible that you're thinking, man, I, I used to live at the feet of Jesus. I used to live a life of worship, but something's changed. And maybe you've turned and, and began to live life a little bit for yourself too much. And maybe you're building your own kingdom a little bit too much. Maybe you desire to attain honor and glory for yourself. Maybe you've forgotten exactly who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. Well, the time is now. And maybe you've never worshipped at the feet of Jesus, but you feel that stirring inside that's leading you to say, Lord, I, I need to give you my all. Well, the time is now. The time is now. There is no better time than today. No better time than today than to offer your all at the feet of Jesus, right? Than to offer your all at the feet of Jesus. I still remember I tell the story when I was a freshman and I was playing football. Well, I was on the football team. I really didn't get to play very much. But I was on the football team and we were supposed to be working out over the summer and every time I would run into my coach, I would have to come up with every excuse in the book why I wasn't working out, right? I'm not seeing you in the weight room, Vince. I'm not seeing you in the weight room, Vince, right? So then one time you saw me, I, I didn't have anything else to say. I said, Coach, I'm sorry, man. It just got away from me. I had to go over the weight room. And he said, he said, well, Vince, he goes, we got two months before whatever. I don't even remember what he said. We got a couple months before this starts, whatever. He said, the best time for you to have been in the weight room was yesterday. The next best time to get into the weight room is now. So go get in there right now. It's like that with Jesus too. The best time to worship Jesus was yesterday. But if you haven't, when's the next best time? Right now. Right now. So as we close and as we pray, I really encourage you, brothers and sisters, think about Mary. Think about Mary and what she did for Jesus. And maybe there's a big lesson in there that we can learn for ourselves. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. And we thank you for the scripture that you give us to guide us. So be with us, Lord, and put it in our hearts to change our lives, to become lives of worship for you. And Lord, if there's anyone here today that does not know you, that has not known you, let them come to you, Lord God, and let them bow at your feet and say, Lord Jesus, forgive me. I am a sinner. And help me, Lord, from this day forward to follow you to leave my past behind me and to focus on you. I love you, Lord. I put my faith in you. And help me to see clearly that I may worship at your feet. And Lord, for those that know you, that have loved you, that, that maybe their life of worship is, has, for whatever reason, gone sideways, let today be the day to renew and to recommit and to say, Lord, bring me back to where I was and show me again my first love of you, Jesus. Lord, with you, all the things that we think are impossible are nothing that can't be overcome. And we ask you to be with us this day. We love you, Jesus, and we ask for this in your name. Amen. God bless you, everybody. Have a wonderful Sunday. Bible study tonight at 6. Enjoy the awesome weather, and uh, Lord willing, we'll see each other again next week. Stay close to Jesus.